So I'm watching you on the, the Fox All-Stars last night, and then an hour or an hour and a half later, your name comes up. <laughs> yes, Mr. Trump is not amused. Yeah. yeah. Boy, how did things ever get south between the two of you? Well, uh, the, uh, it's hard to say how he got into politics. I mean, some people say he's not a conservative. Of course he's not a conservative. He's not a liberal either. He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's been everything at some point or other. Uh, his uh, principles are, uh, shall we say, malleable. Uh, there's an old joke in politics. A politician gets up and takes a forthright stand on every um, burning issue of the day, and at the end of which he says, those are my positions, and if you don't like them, I'll change them. <laughs> uh, but uh, Mr. Trump is uh, tapping into something in America that's in more interesting than he is, something that is uh, more disturbing even than he is. And uh, we don't, I don't think any of us quite fathom what it is yet, but it, to me it is uh, deeply dismaying. I think it was Sunday you made this statement in talking about who gets tough with Donald Trump, that Bobby Jindal, the governor of Louisiana, was the only one who, in your words, had the kidney to actually take it to Trump. He did in a speech at the National Press Club in which he said this is an exercise in narcissism, vanity, egotism. It's all true. Uh, what mystifies me most about the enthusiasm for Trump is people say, well, he tells it like it is. What is the antecedent of the pronoun it? What, I can't discern a fact he's said so far. Uh, it's always, uh, I'm smart and rich, all our leaders are stupid, all our problems are simple, and make me president and good management will take care of everything. Uh, the, Mexicans will build a wall for us. The Chinese will surrender. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't, I, I can't think of it, but particular program he's, he has outlined because he is the program. It's, it's, uh, I, it, it's all about me. I mean, when, when he talks, uh, I like Kenya West because Kenya West likes me. It's always that. But uh, uh, the most serious thing, you know, I, I, I the American, America's problem with immigration is a complex, vexed, troubling one. And no one thinks it's simple except Donald Trump, who says the more than 11 million people here, that's, by the way, the, uh, more than the population of about 20 of our states combined, 11 million people are going to be uh, expelled, 60% of whom have been here more than 10 years. There are four million children who are American citizens, these people. These are people who are in our communities. They uh, work with us. They sit next to us in church. They're, they've been here a long time. I'm going to send them back to their home. I have news that this is our home, their home. I mean, uh, I, I regret that they're here illegally, but let's face facts. And, and Because when you uh, make as a now discussable program what deserves to be called ethnic cleansing in this country, it seems to me you are taking our politics into difficult, dangerous territory. Uh, I'm more of the Jeb Bush style on, on immigration. Uh, I think we need the immigrants to replenish the workforce so that we'll have enough workers as the baby boomers retire to sustain our welfare state, Social Security and all the rest. Uh, I, think, I don't think people come here uh, to get on welfare, they come here to work. The workforce participation rate of illegal immigrants is higher than that of uh, native-born Americans. Jeb Bush got in a lot of trouble for saying people come here as an act of love. That's exactly what it is in most cases. You look at those faces and, and those horrifying pictures of the waves of migrants uh, fathers and mothers with their small children from Syria and Libya and elsewhere, uh, they're not trying to get into Hungary uh, to get on welfare. They're, it, it, they're doing it because they love their children and they want a better life. Let's talk about the refugees, because the president has said, we want to take in 10,000, I think he said. Then Peter King, Congressman King, comes out and says, well, if we do this, we're going to have to make them go through all these hoops before they can come in. That'll take two years. And who knows how much money? Two years to vet an eight-year-old? I mean, what are we talking about? Yeah. We don't, you know, let me do, give a little rant about how we don't get anything done quickly in this country. 
We built the Empire State Building in 410 days during the Depression. We built, that's the world's tallest office building at the time. We built the Pentagon, world's largest office building, in 16 months during the Second World War. We built the George Washington Bridge, very complicated engineering achievement, in 35 months. You know how long it took to build the West Side Highway on Manhattan? 35 years. <laughs> The port of Charleston, I have a home in Kew Island, South Carolina. The port of Charleston is 42 feet deep. They can't take the big new ships coming through the widened Panama Canal. It needs to be dredged 52 feet. That's moving mud for Pete's sake. It's not a technological miracle. They say they can do it in 10 years. Why? Well, because they might find a snail darter or something in there. I mean, because you have to go through so many hoops and th so many regulatory bodies that nothing gets done in America. That's my digression from... I, uh, we, had on, we had on Fox the other night, uh, we had Ron Johnson, Republican from Wisconsin, and he said, well, it takes two years to vet each individual. Why? Yeah. You do not, it does not take two years to vet an eight-year-old in flight from Assad's barrel bombs in Damascus. It just doesn't. People say, well... We can't handle that. As this state knows better than any, we took a million Cubans. We took 125,000 Cubans in 1980 alone. It wasn't nice, it wasn't easy, but it was also not a crisis for this great, large, productive, welcoming, decent country. After Saigon fell in 1975, we took a million Vietnamese in the next 20 years. Took 125,000, same number, in the first year. And you know, about 15 years later, in the state of California, there were a whole lot of high school valedictorians named Nguyen. <laughs> because the immigrants got here, and they did as immigrants often do, they worked harder than the rest of us, because they knew what they'd come from, and they knew how good it was to be here. And they knew the blessings of liberty. And they worked harder, and they were valedictorians, and they're now all over our society. And, you know, the other day, Mr. Trump, I hate to keep coming back to him. <laughs> Trump criticized Jeb Bush because Jeb Bush was campaigning, and someone asked him a question in Spanish, and Jeb Bush answered in Spanish. And Trump said that's a bad example. I read a column pointing out Abraham Lincoln took German lessons because he wanted to be able to speak to the German speakers in central Illinois, where, by the way, he bought a German language newspaper to be able to communicate better with potential constituents. This is the American story. The largest single cohort in the American population are descended from Germans. I'm one of them. Uh, Georg Friedrich Will. Uh, <laughs> father, my grandfather was a Lutheran minister. You know, and just, uh, so my uh, grandmother prayed in German at the, at the dinner table. Uh, this is perfectly normal. Now, the, the First Continental Congress considered at I think Benjamin Franklin's urging that they print the laws in English as well as German. He said, no, the Germans will figure this out. And of course they did. And who thinks, uh, raise your hand if you think we have a tr problem in the United States with unassimilated Germans. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at this. So the question that came up a couple of days ago, why aren't the countries around Syria, beside Turkey, where they've already overrun Turkey, why aren't they taking these refugees in instead of them all going by boat, going by land to Europe, and then we're being asked to take them? Let because, them take them first. Because a lot of those countries are ghastly countries with ghastly governments and riven by uh, the Sunni, Shia bigotries. They're not used to this. Uh, the, the, what the world is suffering from now is the fact that Islamic civilization, you're not allowed to say this, but I am, Islamic civilization is a failure. They've never had a reformation. They've never had uh, a, a constructive encounter with modernity, open societies. Just take one example. Nations that are run by men who are terrified of women are dangerous nations. And I think every Arab nation is like that. Just look at their policies with regard to women. 
dress. I mean, you can't, they're not allowed to drive cars in Saudi Arabia, our friends the Saudis. The answer to your question is these are terrible nations. This election cycle has got people worked up, but I'm also concerned at how uninformed the American people are. We have 24-hour news channels. We have unlimited places to go to get news and information. Yet you'll see things like the late shows show people on street corners being asked questions, and they have no idea. Yeah. You know, they think Iraq is somewhere near Arkansas. I mean, it's, <laughs> uh, what's happened? Is it because there's information overload, or people just can't deal with it? It's too much. Well, there's a difference between information and knowledge. Yes. I mean, the internet is a, is a cornucopia of information. But information, it, it can be just like a fire hose, drinking from a fire hose, but you, you need a kind of organizing, educated, trained mind to cope with all this. And I, I don't think our schools are doing this particularly well. Uh, also, uh, we have completely blurred the line between entertainment and politics. The fact that, I mean, Rush Limbaugh, bless his heart, I knew him when he was at, with the Kansas City Royals selling tickets. Uh, Rush says, I'm an entertainer. Well, it's a little bit dangerous when, because uh, at the end of the day, politics should be fun. It should be boisterous and tumultuous and full of passion and fire. At the end of the day, it's about serious stuff. It's about the so social safety net. It's about nuclear weapons. It's about big things. And, uh, uh, it's not entertainment, it's something more serious. Let's talk about money for a moment. Yeah. David Stockman appeared on CNBC yesterday and he said he thinks that they should raise interest rates instead of worrying just about the people who are buying and mortgaging. Let's talk about the people who are saving. Yeah. Not raising interest rates doesn't give them motivation to save or accrue money. Your thoughts? For seven years now we've had zero interest rates. This is trickle-down economics as practiced by a democratic administration. Zero interest rates were put in place for the purpose of driving people away from safer assets like bonds into the stock market seeking higher yields. And it worked. The Dow average doubled during the Obama administration to the enormous benefit of the 10% of Americans who own 80% of all the directly owned stocks. This was an enormous transfer of wealth to the wealthy. The point of this was, they said, that you will produce what's called a wealth effect. The stock market will go up, people, the wealthy will feel wealthier, and they will spend and invest, and it will trickle down. This is trickle down economics to the rest of us. Uh, it hasn't worked. We've had the worst recovery from a severe recession in American history. Uh, we're now seven years into the recovery. The recovery began in June 2009. Seven years, ladies and gentlemen, we are due for another recession. And when the next recession begins, if we're still at zero interest rates, we will not have any monetary policy to combat it. We'll have fired all the shells from that gun. We have, sitting in the front row, one of my financial analysts, his name is Duke Seegers, and he said on the radio today that he thought that the Fed might look at raising at a quarter here, then six months, another quarter, to get the thing started. Is that viable? It opinion? is, but the, the markets simply panic at the mere mention. Uh, we've seen the markets go down when unemployment goes down, because they say unemployment going down will convince the Fed that the economy is all right, therefore it can raise rates. So they're more afraid of increased rates than they are of increased unemployment. So at this, at this point, it seems to me, uh, it, it's hard to get off that tiger you've been riding. How much is the next level and stage of Obamacare going to drag on the economy? No one knows. That's one of, part of the problem. When you take these continental, um, one-size-fits-all programs like Obamacare, and you, it's like a Calder mobile. You jiggle something here and things jiggle all the way over there. No one knows what the rates are gonna be, premiums. We have attached, through Obamacare, the most rapidly growing portion of our population, the elderly, to our most dynamic science, medicine, as a matter of entitlement. Now, this, it's, 
it's, it's wonderful that we have this great medicine.